your Bibles to Luke 10. We were down at verse 38, getting closer to the end of Luke 10. If you're new with us, let me welcome you. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Our class is working through the whole Bible, uh, every verse of every chapter. We've come all the way from Genesis uh, to the midway point in the Gospel of Luke now. We've really enjoyed, I have enjoyed very much uh, working through the synoptics again, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, seeing uh, how similar they are and how different they are from each other. And of course, when we get to John's Gospel in a few weeks, we'll find it's completely different. Uh, uh, He's talking about the same Jesus Christ, but he just does it very differently from the other three. So you'll find, I think, that study very interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I found a great scholar. I've already read through this whole commentary, and I think you will enjoy his work very much. So what I do is go through and read a commentary written since our last trip through the whole Bible that this class made, and then I just highlight um, the principal arguments that that he or she is making for that particular passage. So uh, I'm reading for you and gleaning down and trying to read just the things that I think are most helpful to you to be sure that you get the basic import of everything these uh, great inspired writers of the Bible have produced for us. Let's pray. God, we bring our concerns, our cares to you. We know you've asked us to pray, even though you know what's in our heart before we voice the words or even form them in our own minds. And so you know our needs today. We're trying to deal faithfully with one of the great books within your all-important book, and we trust you will help us. Uh, We're grateful for people like Dr. Fred Craddock, who've given adult lifetimes dealing with one or more of the 66 books within your big book, and we trust that his work will help us and your Holy Spirit will help us. We seek both in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, verse 38 to the end of the chapter, 10. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying, but Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Okay, let's see what Dr. Craddock has to say. Jesus had just met a man skilled in Scripture who has trouble hearing the Word of God, and Jesus offers him an example, a Samaritan. Now, immediately following, Luke tells us this story of Jesus visiting with a woman so busy serving that she does not hear the word. And Jesus offers her an example, her own sister. To the man, Jesus said, go and do. To the woman, Jesus said, stop going and doing. Sit down, listen, and learn. Dr. Craddock reminds us a number of times in his commentary that Jesus gives very specific advice to one person at a time. That you cannot take any one story and make it universally true, as some do. Uh, Well, he said, sell everything you have and give to the poor. Is that what he said to everybody? No, that's what he said to one man whose riches were keeping him from understanding the kingdom of God. Does he say that women should no longer cook, or men cook, or meals be prepared, or people sit down and eat? No, of course not. But he's there for a brief visit. And one sister Mary is sitting and listening to what he has to say, and the other is so busy preparing the food that when he goes, she will have missed it all. So the advice is specific. The one who's uh, not doing Go and do. The one who's too busy doing, sit and listen. In Luke, it is Martha's house. She receives Jesus into the home, and the story centers on her and Jesus. Her sister Mary is described, but she never speaks or otherwise enters the action. The radicality of the story should not be missed. 
What do you think is radical about this story? Anything that you've gathered from this point? That he goes into a woman's house? That he has discussions with women? Have you been reading your paper this week? The seminary, the Baptist seminary in Fort Worth, has just turned out a woman professor because the Bible says men shall not be taught by women. It's in the Old Testament. But but let me tell you what. There was one Methodist pastor in this city who pastored one of our largest churches 29 years. And for 29 years, he would not allow any woman to teach a Sunday school class that had a man in it. I didn't believe you could build that big a Methodist church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, teaching that, but they did. I'd be glad to be more specific if you'd like. Gail says no. Okay, I will not be too specific. <laughs> Some of us are saying yes. Well, it was Bill Mason and Asbury Church. Uh, we had we had women who came down here to take disciple Bible study and then went back to hear him preach on Sunday. I was amazed, but anyway, they did. I just couldn't believe that you could sell that in a Methodist church today. But the Baptists are still trying really hard, some of them at least, and one of their seminaries that was really a great seminary in Fort Worth has turned out this woman because uh, women aren't supposed to teach men. Uh, so the radicality here is that Jesus enters a woman's house, okay? um, and, and that he spends time treating women as if they're important, that women are capable of learning, that women can have deep thoughts and so on, contrary to much thought of 2,000 years ago. So let's see what Craddock says. In Luke, it is Martha's house. Her sister Mary is described as she never speaks. The radicality of the story should not be missed. Jesus is received into a woman's house. No mention is made of a brother here. And he teaches a woman. Rabbis did not allow women to sit at their feet, that is, to be disciples. It was a man's world. And if you saw, uh, what was the Barbara Streisand movie? Yentl or something? Yentl? Yeah, Yentl. Yentl. No, it was Yentl. It started with a Y, where she, you know, posed herself off as a boy so that she could be taught. Uh, and Barbara Streisand, of course, background is Jewish, and she was telling a story of some time ago uh, when girls simply were not taught. Uh, that was for men. That was for boys, not for women. So this was radical indeed in Jesus' time, uh, radical for Jesus to do it, and radical for Luke to describe it. He does nonetheless. So the Word of God and not food is the one thing most needed. For we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Deuteronomy says so in the Torah. Luke says so in chapter 4 that we read a few weeks ago. And John chapter 6 will say the same. If we censure Martha too harshly, she may abandon serving altogether. And if we commend Mary too profusely, she may sit there forever. So Craddock says there's a time to go and do, and there's a time to listen and reflect. Knowing which and when is a matter of spiritual discernment. If we were to ask Jesus which example applies to us, the Samaritan or Mary, I think he would look us right in the eye and say, yes. Both. Both and. The final petition here is probably eschatological. That is having to do with the end time. Uh, do not lead us into trial. That is the final thrashing about an agony of evil before the end. So which of you... Wait a minute. I skipped it. I turned too many pages here. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let's go to chapter 11. <clears throat> chapter 11. We're going to read the first 13 verses here. Now he, meaning Jesus, was praying in a certain place. And after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we for ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, 
and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Is there any among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Now those last few verses, you probably recognize from our early study as coming in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. Those are right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. It's ask and knock and and so on. Um, Also, uh, if your child asks you for a piece of fish, you don't give him a snake, and so on. This is the reason, you see, in my preaching this year, when I'm going to be preaching virtually all year from Matthew, few Sundays from John, or or other John doesn't get into the lectionary. The lectionary is built around the synoptics, one year from Matthew, one year from Mark, one year from Luke. So John has to be interspersed with those three if he's going to have a voice. And so we're coming to a time right after our Barton Clinton Doherty series this year when we will have three Sundays in a row from John. But most of it's going to be from Matthew. And, of course, in a Sunday morning sermon, I don't have time to give them the background that, that I can give you. But I hope none of you are troubled any longer when I say to you that Jesus probably never preached the Sermon on the Mount in one setting. Uh, That Matthew has in front of him this quella, this source of just teaching, teaching, teaching. Luke has it in front of him too. And Luke uses the same words, I mean verbatim, often sentence by sentence, paragraph at a time. But Luke disperses this material. He has a sermon on the plain, but it's much briefer than the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. And so Luke has taken this material and puts it into different... And we think even Luke was choosing the time and place to use it because both of them are basically using the outline of Mark. Uh, We can tell because they they copied Mark, sometimes whole sentences, paragraphs, directly from Mark. And so Luke thinks, ah, this is the time this teaching really fits. This is the proper context for it. And Matthew thinks, no, no, this is a different context. And the different contexting of the material often changes the meaning. And so scholars say, like Dr. Brandon Scott, who was with us, that Jesus probably didn't explain these things. He said them and walked away. Matthew puts them into a certain context, which affects the meaning. Luke puts them into a certain context, which affects the meaning. So here we have materials that in Matthew appear in the Sermon on the Mount. It doesn't mean that anybody's trying to deceive you. It means that Matthew thinks early on in his Gospel, chapters 5, 6, and 7, we need all this teaching material. And he pulls it together and puts it right there. Luke says, no, no, I think there's a better way to do that. We think Luke was written after Matthew. And so Luke says, no, this this really needs to be here, and this needs to be here, and this needs to be here. So I hope that's not troubling to you anymore. If you've been with us all this way, I, I think you can understand that we don't believe... The Bible got handed down on golden plates uh, that that people with third grade educations could translate and so on. We believe God worked through very real people. That Matthew and Luke, Mark, John, are dealing with the material the best they know how, as faithfully as they know how, but each is writing to a particular audience, a certain readership. Okay? All right. With that said, let's see what Dr. Craddock says. There is no reason for the reader to assume that Jesus said all these things on one occasion. And Luke divides the material up even more than Matthew does. So neither Matthew nor Luke um, agrees on just how much of the material was spoken at one time in one place and how much of it was distributed within about three years of teaching. 
Jesus at prayer is a frequent and very important image in Luke's Gospel. Jesus' prayer life has now prompted a request from a disciple. Teach us how to do that. It was not unusual for rabbis to teach specific prayers. Uh, Rabbi Charles Sherman, Rabbi Mark Fitzeman could show you great volumes of prayers written by rabbis of long ago. Um, notice that the text treats prayer as a learned experience, not simply as a release of feelings. Discipline is clearly implied. And let me stop and say, Dr. Craddock's understanding is also Boston Avenue clergy's understanding. We are criticized by other groups sometimes that we do not give extemporaneous prayers. If they watch on television because it was icy and cold and they didn't have church, they say, well, look at the Methodists. They read their prayers. Yep, we do. Because we believe if one is going to stand up and read 1,600 in prayer or 200,000 on television, in prayer, one should give that prayer a lot of thought. And so I say to these associate ministers, give time to your prayer. Say what you believe God wants our people to be asking for. The things that you believe God wants to be utmost in their hearts as they address God in prayer. You don't know everybody's heart any more than I do when I'm writing the sermon, but where do you think our people are? Where, what do you think is on their heart and mind? Address that in your prayer. And write as carefully as you can the best two-minute prayer you can write to lead the rest of us in prayer. That doesn't mean that you and I may not have our minds moving off in different directions as we hear the prayer. That's perfectly acceptable. If you hear something that moves your prayer in a different direction, that's fine. But the person is leading you in prayer. You can then move on from there. So Craddock is saying here, prayer is not just a release of feelings. It can be that. You can say to God whatever you need and want to say to God. But it's also a learned experience. Discipline is clearly implied. And the Lord's Prayer, the one Jesus did teach us, even though Luke has it differently from Matthew, they're not exactly the same. Even so, what he taught his disciples, we can learn about how to structure our own prayers. What was Jesus saying ought to be foremost in your prayer? And you know, it begins with praise of God, hallowed be thy name, and so on. All these things, we won't take time to do all of that right now. We do have classes here where we deal with prayer and how to structure prayer, and how to move through the various things that Jesus taught his disciples were important when one prays. So, anyway, I defend our clergy writing their prayers. Last Wednesday morning, I prayed for downtown Tulsa Unlimited breakfast. Uh, it, was a, it was a business breakfast. Uh, Mr. Himmelfarb, whom the mayor uh, talked into coming out of retirement after he had been head of a dollar thrifty automobiles nationwide, she talked him into being head of economic development for the city. Mr. Himmelfarb was the speaker. Okay, I know Mr. Himmelfarb is Jewish. Uh, even if he were not the speaker, I know that in the business community of Tulsa there are other Jews there at these breakfasts. I was more aware of that than some others. Breakfast included bacon and eggs. Uh, Mr. Himmelfarb didn't eat his bacon, I noticed. But anyway, um, so they could use a little sensitivity training here, um, you know, as, as to what could be served for breakfast. You certainly can serve a breakfast without ham or bacon. But anyway, I didn't just step up there when the president of Downtown Tulsa Unlimited asked me, okay, Dr. Biggs from Boston Community Church will lead us in our prayer. That prayer was very carefully written out. And... Uh, while other things, introductions were being made and so on, I was reading it over and over. It had been written the day before, and I was ready to do it. So and there may be some that say, well, the method is they don't know how to pray without writing it down. Well, we know how to pray. I can do an extemporaneous prayer. But Dr. Craddock is right here, and he's not a Methodist. He's a disciple. 
that prayer is a discipline as well. It's not only about feelings, it's also about discipline. How is it proper to address Almighty God and include the people who are present, if you're praying publicly, how to include all the people as you address uh, the Creator? Okay, let's go on. Luke's form of the Lord's Prayer is briefer than the more familiar and liturgically extended version in Matthew. And again, Matthew puts the Lord's Prayer in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 6 of Matthew's Gospel. And when he says it's been liturgically expanded, you'll find that neither one of them ends, for thine is the power uh, and the glory and forever. So that's liturgically added on. Uh, by the church down through the centuries. It's not in Matthew. It's not in Luke. Anyway, in Luke, the prayer consists of two brief petitions of praise and three petitions for those who are praying. The prayer is that of a community. It's us and we, not I and my. It's not of a private individual. And the community's primary desire should be the coming of God's kingdom, God's reign. If you learn nothing more in our going through all four of the Gospels again than this, that Jesus was about the kingdom of God. That's what he was all about, the kingdom of God. How do we acknowledge that God reigns? God is the sovereign? Though God is not imposing his will on any one of us, we all get to make choices. But when we do God's will, things tend to get so much better. God's will is the right way for all creation to work wonderfully well and that we are supposed to be working with God according to God's will. Let's do our work where we see God working and let's do our work the way God wants His work done. That's the idea. So this prayer that Jesus taught is about the kingdom again. Okay, The community's primary desire is for the coming of the kingdom of God. God's reign. It is therefore an eschatological prayer which means an end time. That you and I have given up hope that we're ever going to get this completely right here on this time and place. But sometime, somewhere, somehow God will finally make it all come to be. This eschatological prayer then has a quality underlined by the short phrases such as thy kingdom come. The final petition is probably eschatological also. Do not lead us into trial. Remember that those who love to do a talk about the left behind and so on, they always imagine this hot and fiery trial at the end. That's what John the baptizer thought Jesus was going to bring. He didn't. And I told you last Sunday that so many of these who, the millions who've read Left Behind and all those movies and so on, they didn't like the Messiah they got either. They still want the one to bring fire and burn up everybody else. When we were in Israel one time, we had a, a sergeant major of the Israeli army uh, was not on active duty at the time and he was guiding us. And uh, our people from Boston Avenue at nighttime after dinner and so on, they would be asking him, well, why did you Jews do this? Why did the Israelis do this? Why did you not do so and so? And he said to me one night uh, when they had all gone on to bed and I was about to tell him good night and go to, uh, to our room, he said, I had a group just before you all came. They never criticized Israel. Never. And your people criticized Israel. And I said, who were you guiding? He was guiding Hal Lindsey, who wrote Late Great Planet Earth. I said, well, let me tell you the difference. Hal Lindsey's theology is that you have to do really well in order for the Messiah to come back. So he wants you to do really well. Anything you do is perfectly fine with him, because that's going to bring Jesus back much quicker. But once he gets here, then you're going to hell. According to Hal Lindsey, our people disagree with Israel at certain points. They think Israel does some things really well, and Israel doesn't do some other things quite so well. But we believe you are children of God, and that God has never revoked your covenant with them, and that God is going to love you forever. There's a big difference, I said. 
questions. Answer our people's questions as honestly and openly as you can. Because they're going to love you when they get on the plane and fly home again. They're going to love you. And they did. They still ask about Jacob. How do you think Jacob's doing? Every time bombs are falling in Israel, how do you think Jacob's doing? So I was right about that. So these are the, the big differences um, as to how we understand ourselves within the covenant people of God. Okay. Let's go on. I think we're ready to go on. Let's look at, well, let me see if there's anything else here. Ah, yes. When he gets to this part about which of you, which asks the reader to identify with someone going at midnight to ask a friend for bread, the attention shifts totally to the friend in bed who finally gets up. And finally, parables beginning with the question, which one of you, as a general rule, has as the expected answer, no one. No one of us would get up in the middle of the night and go knock at our neighbor's door and say, I need some loaves of bread. Somebody's come and I don't have anything to feed them. But even if you were to do that, the man would finally give you bread just so you would go away. Surely God, who loves you, God who wants good to come to you all the time, will listen when you pray. Okay, that message does not lie in comparing God to a friend who responds only under pressure. Rather, the point is that if our friends answer importunate, that is, shameless appeals, how much more will God, who desires to give us the kingdom? The concluding unit of the passage we just read extends further the reasoning from lesser to greater. Or, how much more will God respond to you than a neighbor? The analogy moves from friends to parents. If parents give good gifts, how much more so will God? Luke has egg and scorpion instead of Matthew's loaf and stone, but with no real difference in the meaning. Prayer is to be continual, asking, seeking, knocking. All of these are present imperative verbs. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. But even so, this persistence is within a parent-child relationship which assures, finally, good gifts from God. In Luke, it is the Holy Spirit. Matthew says, God knows how to give you good things. Luke says, God will give you the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is central in Luke, both his gospel and the book of Acts, of course. When the Holy Spirit comes, wonderful things will happen. When the Holy Spirit comes to Jesus' followers in Acts, they will be led and empowered to continue what Jesus began to do and teach before he was received up. Without the Holy Spirit, there was not, there is not a church. The Holy Spirit's all important. Let me tell you, one time years ago, but since I've been here in Tulsa, a prominent couple in this church, uh, and not in, uh, yeah, they were in this church at the time, um, no longer live here in the city. A very prominent first couple, though, if I were to mention their name, you, you all of you would know them, had a son who committed suicide. And uh, I heard it on the news that afternoon late as I was driving home from the church. Uh, and so the minute I got home, I called this family and got the other son and said, I, I know your mother and father are going to have calls coming from anywhere and everywhere. Just would you be sure that they know I've called? And if I can help, I will come in a moment if they need me when they want me to. Thank you very much, he said. Well, this was a little before 6 o'clock in the afternoon, I guess, and I heard nothing. And finally it was 10 o'clock, and I had brushed my teeth, and, and uh, had my pajamas on and was ready to go to bed, and the phone rang. And it was that son saying, uh, everything's quietened down now, and I'm in bed. I wondered if you could come. I said, sure. So I redressed, and I hurried over to their house. And they were dealing with this the way most people deal with death. They would remember something really wonderful about their son, and they could laugh. And then, of course, in the next moment, they would be crying again because they realized what a great, great loss had come. But after they, you know, reminisced about this son of theirs, finally the man asked, Is it true that people who commit suicide do not get to go to heaven? And I was, one of those moments when you're saying, Oh God, help me with the right answer here. Help me with the right answer here. And this passage, I was really thinking of the Matthew passage uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, but the same idea. 
I said, remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. If you, being evil, meaning not perfect, not nearly like God, if you have a son who asks you for a piece of fish, you don't give him a serpent. If he asks for bread, you don't give him a little rock that looks like bread. If you then, being sinful, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much greater is our Father in heaven to know how to give you good things? That's what Matthew says, give you good things. And then I said, this last hour or so, I've gotten the distinct impression that you two did not quit loving this young man at 5.30 this afternoon. Oh, no, no, we didn't. And I said, can you outlove God? No. I said, well, if you didn't quit loving him because he did something irrational that hurt you deeply and all who loved him deeply, I don't think God quit loving him either. And then Daddy hugged me, and the mother hugged me, and I said a prayer, and I went home. I think that was the right answer, wasn't it? If you being evil know how to give good gifts, how much greater does our Father in heaven? Well, Luke says, uh, God will give you the Holy Spirit. And that makes everything great. So one should not set too high a premium on ousting evil spirits, says Jesus, unless the removal of the evil is followed by filling the life. With, uh, I think I skipped another page here. Sorry. I'm, I'm digressing too much. Let's go back to the text. Verse 14. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the one who had been mute spoke, and the crowds were amazed. But some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Others, to test him, kept demanding from him a sign from heaven. But he knew what they were thinking and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself becomes a desert, and house falls on house. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out the demons by Beelzebul. But if I cast out the demons by Beelzebul... By whom do your exorcists cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out the demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. And see, that's the point of the Gospels. The kingdom of God has come to you. When a strong man fully armed guards his castle, his property is safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Go a little farther. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it wanders through waterless regions looking for a resting place, but not finding any, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. But when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and live there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. Now, while he was saying this, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Let's see what Dr. Craddock says. No one in the story, Luke tells us, denies that the man has been freed from the mute demon. The evidence is clear. The man who could not speak is now speaking. The question is, by what power did Jesus do this? The fact that good has been done, and all of them would have agreed a man healed is good, does not in the biblical world automatically mean that God has acted. In fact, that the man was mute does not automatically mean an evil spirit was at work. Recall that Zechariah was mute, but he was doing, but it was God's doing. There are powers, and then there are powers, the ancients believed. The magicians in Egypt matched Moses miracle for miracle for several rounds, as you recall. When he finally got to, to that eighth, ninth, and tenth one, uh, they ran out of steam, but they were right with him on all those first ones. Modern minds ponder such unusual events and ask, did that really happen? Luke's audience pondered such unusual events and asked, who did this? See the difference? We ask, 
did that really happen? A man who couldn't speak can now speak? The ancient saw a change and asked, who did that? The charge against Jesus is that he is using the power of Beelzebul, which literally means Baal. Here in, in our translations, it's spelled B-E-E-L, but in fact, in the Hebrew scriptures, it's spelled B-A-A-L. We used to call it Baal when you and I were growing up, the old god Baal. Now scholars say that wasn't right. It really has two syllables, so it's Baal. So here, Baal is that same one. Uh, the pagan god of the Canaanites, uh, confronted by Moses and others all that long, long time ago. Jesus is healing by the power of the Baal. Jesus answers the charge in three ways. First, with logic. That is, the Satan would not work against himself. Surely, if something good has happened, how could this be the work of the Satan? With a comparison. By what power do exorcists among you work? And with a challenge. If I work by the finger of God, then God's kingdom is here. The Satan is strong, but now he is being overthrown by a stronger power. Jesus offers no other proofs. His hearers have seen and heard. Now they must choose. Just as he said to the disciples of John the Baptist, when asked, are you the one we're expecting, or should we wait for another? Go tell John what you see. John will have to decide. That's true here. Uh, his hearers have seen a man who couldn't speak, now speak. They've heard his description of how that occurred. Now they have to choose whether what he said is true or not. The Holy Spirit and spirits that hurt, maim, and alienate do not walk together. The one who is not with me is against me. One should not set too high a premium on ousting evil spirits, says Jesus, unless the removal of evil is followed by filling the life with something good, then more evil will return. An empty life, like an empty house, invites intruders. Some response to Jesus was favorable. There's an outburst by a woman in the crowd that registers her approval. It may be that this blessing of Jesus' mother was placed here by Luke under the influence of Mark, who locates the coming of Jesus' mother and brothers after the Beelzebul controversy. So for Mary and for all, hearing and doing bring blessing. All right, let's go on. Verse 29. And when the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is an evil generation. It asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so the Son of Man will be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them, because she came from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. And see, something greater than Solomon is here. The people of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the proclamation of Jonah. And see, something greater than Jonah is here. No one, after lighting a lamp, ah, where does this come from in Matthew? He lumps it in with the Sermon on the Mount again. So this, this next few verses about the no one lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel and so on. That's in the Sermon on the Mount for Matthew. Here Luke has parceled out these teachings. Uh, or Luke found them parceled out in the quella. Matthew would have also, and then bunched them up and put them in one sermon. Uh, we don't know exactly how that happened. But simply to say that Matthew puts a lot of teachings together, enough for three chapters full, Luke chooses to scatter it out. Let's go on. No one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar, Luke says, rather than under a bushel, but on the lampstand, so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if it is not healthy, your body is full of darkness. Therefore consider whether the light in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, with no part of it in darkness, it will be as full of light as when a lamp gives you light with its rays. Notice that Jesus said you put a lamp on a, 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 a lighted lamp on a candlestick so that it gives light to all that are in the house. 
You know what scholars glean from that? It was a really little house. If you can light one candle, then it gives light to everybody in the house. It was a really little house. And this story that Jesus just told, a man's already sound asleep with all of his kids in the bed. He just had one bed, you see. It's a little one-room house. One bed. Everybody eats, sleeps, everything in one room. But anyway, most of the people to whom Jesus was talking were poor. Most of the people to whom these two, Matthew and Luke in this case, Mark, they are all writing mostly to very poor people. Luke will even say the common people heard him gladly. Okay, let's go on. In the setting of the exorcism, the demand was for a sign from heaven, evidence that it was from God, not from Satan. Faith is more than response to evidence, and to the one who will not trust, final proof is never quite enough. Jesus says the search for signs is therefore the quest of persons who are evil, that is, disobedient and rebellious. Miracles seldom generate faith, rather they spawn curiosity argument and an increased appetite for more signs. More signs. I heard Willie Nelson interviewed one time. They asked him why didn't he do all those big fancy shows like Garth Brooks and others with lights going off and cannons and everything else and flying through the air. And Willie said, if you put on a show like that, tomorrow night you got to do something bigger. And the next night, something bigger yet. I just have a guitar and we sing. One sign demands a bigger sign. Mark says no sign will be given. Notice Mark says no sign will be given to you. In Mark's gospel, the disciples are dull, dense, they don't get it. And he says, Jesus said, well, I'm not giving you any sign. Luke and Matthew agree that the only sign is the sign of Jonah. However, for Matthew... Jonah's three days and nights in the whale was a sign of Jesus' death and resurrection. But for Luke, the sign of Jonah was about the preaching. But Jonah did finally go to Nineveh. Luke says nothing about three days dead and then alive again. Now, he believes in the resurrection. He'll talk about it later, but not in this context. In this context, he believes the sign of Jonah is about Jonah's finally going and preaching. And guess what? when he thought they would not repent and that God would finally blast them, they did repent. Then Jonah sulked, you remember. Sulked. He got terribly unhappy that God, well, I, that's why I didn't want to preach to them. I knew you'd forgive them. The Ninevites received Jonah with repentance. The queen of the south, Sheba, received wisdom from Solomon. And therefore, the people of Nineveh and the queen of the south, Luke says, Jesus said, will judge Jesus' audience. For those who are listening to Jesus do not receive a prophet greater than Jonah, a man wiser than Solomon. They don't see him being who he is. The unit concludes by Luke's joining three sayings under the general image of light. So what Dr. Craddock is saying is he think in the Quella, Luke found this, and he found this, and he found this, and all of them were about light, and he pulls them together here. This unit concludes by Luke's joining three sayings under the general image of light. Jesus' message is clear enough and able to give God's light to people of real integrity and openness. All right? Everybody got that? Let's go to verse 37. We're doing great here. Now, while he was speaking, a Pharisee invited him to dine with him. So he went in and took his place at the table. Now, let me just remind you that most of our best scholars believe Jesus was himself a Pharisee. And out of the 17 different groups, at, at least that's what Dr. Charlesworth said he can identify, Dr. Charlesworth at Princeton University Seminary, who's a United Methodist teaching on that faculty, in a presentation here in Tulsa a few years ago, he said, I can identify 17 different factions within Judaism at the time Jesus left. You and I know about Sadducees and Pharisees and Zealots and so on. But he says there were 17 of them. And out of the 17, the one that survived, the Pharisaic movement, the Pharisees. And the truth is that the folks at Temple Israel and Congregation B'nai Amunah are 
Pharisees. They're descendants of the Pharisaic movement. And most believe Jesus was himself a Pharisee. Okay. So while he was speaking, a Pharisee invited him to dine with him so that he went in and took his place at the table. In other words, what they're saying is when Jesus and the Pharisees sort of go at each other, it's a family quarrel. It's a family quarrel. He really cares about these people. They're giving him a tough time. He really cares about them. The Pharisee was amazed to see that he did not first wash before dinner. That doesn't mean his hands were dirty. It means that ceremonially. Have you ever seen a Roman Catholic priest in front of the congregation wash his hands before he celebrates the sacrament? They don't always do that publicly now. But when, when Gail's Uncle Philip died, uh, her dad's oldest brother, uh, Uncle Philip had remained with the Mother Church all these years. Some of the others had, had moved to Protestant parts of Christianity. But Uncle Philip had remained a Roman Catholic. And uh, he had lived past 90 years of age, and so it was a relatively small group of people there, most of us family. But this priest did all the things. Uh, and a little basin was brought by one of the altar boys. And he washed his hands in front of all of us and dried them on a white cloth. And after all, we weren't many Catholics there. Uh, most of us weren't allowed to participate in the communion. But those who did, when they had had opportunity, the priest made it, you know, a, a, without saying anything, made a big show that he was drinking it to the very last drop and then took that white cloth and wiped it out with chalice very carefully so that not a drop was left. Uh, so that's the point here. Jesus did not ceremonially wash his hands. Then the Lord, notice how Luke rarely calls him Jesus anymore. Already he sees him as the Lord, the risen Lord. Now the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. What he's saying is, uh, which dirt is more harmful? What's on the outside of a cup or what's on the inside of a cup? You wash the outside, but not the inside. Of course, he's talking about them. Uh, <clears throat> inside you are full of greed and wickedness, you fools. Notice here what he calls them. And yet he says, folks who call others fools are in danger of hellfire. You remember, this is dangerous business you're doing here. You fools. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? So give for alms those things that are within. And see, everything will be clean for you. But woe to you, Pharisees. For you tithe mint and rue and herbs of all kinds. They all, if they could afford it, had little herb gardens. Spices, you and I know, have everything to do with how something tastes. And they were so strict in giving the Lord a tenth of everything, they even brought a tenth of mint and rue and herbs. And yet Jesus said, you neglect justice and the love of God. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love to have the seat of honor in the synagogues and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves. Remember, uh, ceremonially again, ritually, if they got too close to a dead body, they were considered unclean. Probably that had to do with their not knowing Often what caused a person to die, they didn't understand disease nearly like we did. They certainly knew nothing of bacteria or, or viruses and so on. This was an unknown world to them. So when somebody died, um, the body was probably cared for, but only by certain people. And that's true at B'nai Amuna today. The Temple Israel is reformed, and they don't do this. But at B'nai Amuna, there still is a certain group of people who come to the home of one who's died and took care of the body and so on. When I was a boy, the family still washed the body and dressed the body and so on. Well, anyway, uh, they weren't supposed to get too close to graves, and so graves were carefully marked so that you didn't accidentally contaminate yourself, so to speak. They were usually painted with white whitewash on the outside so that you knew that's a grave. Don't get too close. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them, unmarked graves, without realizing it. And one of the lawyers asked him, and here this doesn't mean one who argues uh, 
in court the way we would think of attorneys today. This means one steeped in the Torah, one who really knows the Torah well. Answered him, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us too. And he said, Woe also to you lawyers, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not lift a finger to ease them. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets. They build great tombs to honor the prophets whom your ancestors killed. He's saying, you're not consistent here, you say. So you are witnesses and approve of the deeds of your ancestors, for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore, also the wisdom of God said, this is coming out of the Septuagint, the Hebrew Scriptures in Greek, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that this generation may be charged with the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary, the set-apart place. Yes, I tell you, it will be charged against this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. And when he went outside, the scribes and the Pharisees began to be very hostile toward him and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. Matthew places much of this material, and he's going to contrast Matthew and Luke here, Matthew places much of this material at the close of Jesus' ministry during the intense debates and interrogations in Jerusalem. Luke places these clashes in the home of a Pharisee where Jesus is a dinner guest. It reminds us that Jesus and Pharisees had much in common. They worshiped together every Sabbath at the synagogue, Jesus often was a dinner guest with Pharisees, and it was Pharisees who warned Jesus about Herod's desire to kill him. The woes against these Pharisees center on three issues, giving meticulous care to legal details, but neglecting God's greater justice and love. Second, coveting attention and pride of place, and being hidden contaminators of the nation's life like buried graves. The three woes against the lawyers have to do with burdening others while claiming personal exemption, honoring dead prophets while consenting to and participating in the very causes of their deaths, and confusing the people by the gross incongruities between their lives and what they're teaching. The expression, wisdom of God, in verse 49, undoubtedly refers to Jesus himself. He is wisdom personified, if you will. The scribes and the Pharisees, who felt convicted by Jesus' words, continued to provoke him to say something self-incriminating. The other comment is a warning of Jesus to his disciples concerning the harmful influence of hypocritical Pharisees. Remember the word hypocrite was a word that came from the, the stage, people who wore masks. So hypocrites uh, were acting a role that wasn't really true of them, is what he's trying to say. Well, we've run out of time. We're going to stop right there. We did right well today. Those were long chapters. Next Sunday will be February. February 4, my only sister's birthday next Sunday.